Hi everyone, Stepan here. In today's video I'm going to continue the endgame series with best endgames played by Viswanathan Anand or Vishy Anand who is, who is one of the greatest players of all time undoubtedly. He's still very active as you know uh, despite his quite late age for professional chess and he is still extremely strong. I've chosen four endgames uh, from well earlier stages of his career. The first one was played in 1989 against the great Boris Spassky when Vichy Anand was 20 years old. And the last one I chose was played in 2000 and it was actually part of the final match which got Vichy the first out of his five world championship titles. Okay, so Vichy is known for extremely precise play. Uh, but uh, unlike some other very solid players like uh, Carlsen or, or Karyakin, he, he is also able to calculate extremely well still. But when he was younger, when he was in his 20s and 30s, he was a machine. I think he was the only one, probably uh, along with Kasparov and Divanchuk, that, that's my opinion, who was able for such brute force calculation on a level of, of a machine. Okay, so, so let's start. Uh, if you would like to follow the video along with the PGN and the analysis, you can find it in your Patreon feed if you're, a, if you're a patron of mine. If you'd like to become one, there's a link in the description. So the first game I chose is Anand versus Spassky played in the Tournament of Generations in 1989. Spassky was 52 at the time, so quite actually vicious age at the moment, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and we have an end game in which both sides have five pawns, two knights, bishop, and two rooks. And it's Vicious' turn, Vish is white here. So, in my opinion, black is threatening to play e3, and that would make his a8 bishop a very strong piece. Uh, it would give him attacking chances, it would dislodge the f2 knight, that pawn could be in trouble, but if black can manage to well consolidate with a move such as knight f6 and then knight d5 and challenge this pin along the c file, then he could be good. So when I was analyzing this, I was considering the move knight g4, which is a good move and sort of strengthens the d5 square as well after knight e3, and that could help lift the blockade. The problem though is that after something like king g7, this pawn could, could advance to f5, of course, now that's impossible because of the pin. So knight g4 would be quite passive. Uh, another option, which is just bad, is taking on, on e4. For the moment you, of course, have three attackers, but there's a pin along the c-file. So if, for example, knight f to e4, then bishop takes e4, and after... You, you cannot take, of course, because rook takes c1. So, for example, rook to c2 was the move I was calculating. In this position, Black can simply avoid a check with king to g7 and prepare to strengthen the bishop with f5. So he could just play king to g7 and now you have nothing better but to play rook takes e4. But there's a trick now, rook takes c3 and after rook e8, rook b3. The position is of course better for black. Black has two knights for the rook and black is minus one. Not completely winning, but very close to winning. So instead of that, Vichy found an incredible move, uh, which probably isn't that hard to see, but it's very risky to play that move. He played the move d5, and I like this move very much. That's not a move I would ever consider playing because of this threat of e3. And in fact, Boris Spassky did not play e3, which he should have done. Let me just show you the main variations after e3, which is by far the most obvious move. I mean, you're risking that pawn once it gets to e2, you're risking to lose the pawn, but you get enough peace activity, you get enough play. So after e3, knight g4 is forced attacking the pawn, now e2, and you continue rook c2, putting pressure on the pawn. Now it's attacked three times, but black has the option of trading pawns. He can play bishop takes d5, and of course you take with the knight, challenging the c7 rook, and after knight takes d5, defending the rook. Uh, if if, excuse me, if rook takes c2, then white simply wins after knight f6 check, and you don't have a better option. 
but to play knight f6 and knight f6 if king g7 you take this rook with check so king h8 and simply bishop takes c2 and of course white is a piece up so after knight takes d5 black would have to recapture with the knight and now rook c2 for example rook takes e2 rook takes e2 this endgame should be equal but because of this bishop and because of the 2 to 1 pawn majority, white definitely is better. It's not a winning advantage, but in practical play, white should win this more often than not. Because if this rook gets to e7, then it's going to become extremely tricky. Also, this knight has a ton of great squares it could go to. Uh, these knights will have to protect each other. And this rook has no good infiltration squares. c2 is covered twice. If c1, then king h2. If this was a dark squared bishop, then it would be a completely different story. So this endgame would be better for white, but definitely holdable. And that perhaps explains why Spassky did not go for, for e3. Instead he played king g7, which unpins and makes sense. But now simply knight f takes e4. And the second crucial moment in the game, Sp Spassky of course uh, takes on d5, and there's still a pin. On, on, on c1 so you cannot really take multiple times because in the end the e4 knight is going to be hanging let, let me just show you that if knight takes d5 then rook takes c1 rook takes c1 and rook e4 would be equal probably slightly better for white again now now black has held on to his bishop so he shouldn't have any issues another option could be bishop takes d5 but now simply bishop takes d5 and after knight takes d5 rook c1 rook c1 and rook takes e4 is a dead draw even though white has two pawns on the queen side that's that's just a draw so we should play an excellent move and this had of course been calculated before he played d5 which just shows how how strong he was in anticipating uh, the strengths in his position. So he basically plays a move that declines multiple piece trades. He allows one, uh, trading on e1. But this move knight d6 is, is incredible. Firstly, the knight cannot really be attacked. It's going to be very hard to put pressure on that knight. Uh, it's an octopus knight in the middle of black's position, controlling a ton of key squares, and most importantly, attacking f7. So after rook e1, Rook e1, uh, what does he do? What does Spassky do? So you sort of would like to defend the e7 square, but then your, your knight is loose. And if, for example, knight f6, then this is still a bad position. I mean, there, there's a ton of pressure. And I, I don't know, knight, knight 7 to f6 doesn't seem like a good move. I was thinking rook c5. To just defend the knight and this keeps guarding the e7 square so what i'm trying to do is keep my knight on d5 to control e7 but now simply knight to e4 and after rook a5 for example now you can continue knight g5 and this pawn is dropping um, that there's really no salvation if you play knight f6 i take on f7 if you play f6 i can check you and enter with my uh, with my pieces so for example something like this uh, and and these knights are now very strong this pin is extremely annoying in fact I, yeah th th this is just a bad position so in the game Spassky allowed rook e7 he played knight f6 and after rook e7 this is very hard now rook c6 played attacks the knight but rook takes f7 comes with tempo king h6 played and knight c4 simply a pawn up now it's not game over yet Spassky is an extremely tricky player, as we are going to see. But watch, watch what happens. So uh, I'm going to go through this move, these moves fairly quickly until we reach a critical position. So Anand improves his uh, king's position. Spassky improves his pieces. This knight coming to d2 is an excellent move. The knight wasn't really doing much on c4. h5, knight to b3. And now the knight is looking at the d4 square knight e5 and rook a7 attacking the pawn now you you could defend passively but that's not easy to do uh, because the e4 square is <clears throat> attacked twice by white and if you move the bishop away well then you have to move it to a very passive square which would allow knight e4 or bishop e4 
Also, there is knight c5 on the cards. So Spassky plays an excellent move. Unfortunately for him, Anand had foreseen all of this. So if you can spot a tactic like this and know that you are better after that and play rook a7 anyway, then you are a genius, both in endgame planning and in calculation. So th this is basically the reason why I chose this game. d5 and the refutation of Spassky's next uh, sacrifice, which looks really nice. He plays knight g4 check. And now you, you have nothing better but to take the piece. I mean, if, if you decline the piece, then what do you do? So takes. Knight g4. Now it should be said that uh, king g3 and king f1 uh, will both lead, will, oh, excuse me, excuse me, uh, it should be said that king h1 and, uh, king g1 and king g3 both lead to a mate in one, like this, or like this, because the knight is guarding these two squares. So Anand is forced to play king f1, and now the whole point of the sacrifice is of course knight e3 check, grabbing the bishop, but after king g1, knight takes bishop, Anand is simply able to take on a6. So this now is a winning endgame, and this these two connected passed pawns on the queen side are just overwhelming, so he'd seen all of this before rook a7. Let's see what happened. Bishop d7, rook e6, bishop e6. Spassky offers a rook trade in hopes that that's going to lead to simplification, that's going to lead a draw. To lead, to lead to a draw, knight c5, bishop c4, a4, the pawns start moving forward. King f4, a5, the pawns marching on. Knight b4, b3 chases the bishop away. Knight d3 check. A brilliant move. Uh, if... Okay, let's... Uh, let's discuss this. Uh, so what's holding uh, what's holding white back? Well, if he advances the pawn, uh, black could actually do this. So if, if a3, then knight takes, knight takes, and bishop takes. And in this position, this is just a draw. Uh, this pawn is going to be traded off, and it's going to be a draw. So what he has to do, he has to make sure that this pawn is not captured. So knight d3, sacrificing a knight. Now, if you don't take, then I take your knight and I and I win. So takes. Now a6. Bishop e8, excellent move. The only move to prevent an immediate loss, threatening uh, bishop to c6. So if, for example, a7, bishop c6, then black wins easily. The pawns are blockaded. The knight is dominated, and this is just game over. But after Anand's next move, uh, Boris Pasky actually resigned. He played knight d5 check. And here's the point. After the king moves, doesn't matter where the king moves. Let's say king e5 attacking the knight. Then you continue knight e7. And now there's no bishop c6. I'm just going to do this. You are not stopping my pawn. So after knight d5, Spassky resigned. So d5 as the first great move, then uh, refuting this sacrifice with knight g4, and then finally knight d3. I think this is an astonishing game. And he, he was only 20 years old, and this is just... Spassky has so much experience. That this is remarkable. I really enjoyed this game. Okay, the next game is not really uh, here... Well, it's not really as valuable as the other three. I wanted to show you this game to show you how cleanly Anand uh, converts his advantages. This is, of course, winning for black. And unlike the other three games, the Spassky game was drawn with perfect play by, by, his, by Spassky. This game is winning for Anand, even if white plays perfectly. But I wanted to show you this game just to show you how precise he was and how he gave his opponent absolutely no chances. On the white side, it's Anatoly Karpov, who was a monster in 1991. So, a brief intro. Uh, this was the 1991 quarterfinal match for the World Championship. Uh, Karpov uh, won the match, four and a half, three and a half, and was defeated by Nigel Short in the semifinals. And in the finals, Short defeated Timon, seven and a half, five and a half. And this was 1991. 
Timan was supposed to face Kasparov in the match for the World Championship. But this is the year where Kasparov and Short complained uh, about the corruption in FIDE and split to, to set up PCA, Professional Chess Association. Okay, and then they held their own match. Uh, the event was held in, in London. Uh, just a second, uh, Kasparov won, won the match, uh, short lost, and as a result of this match, Fide stripped Kasparov of his title and removed him and Nigel short, short from the rating list and arranged an official Fide match between Timan and Karpov. So Karpov had nevertheless been uh, qualified to the, to the final match despite losing, and Timan, who was supposed to play Kasparov, was playing was playing in the finals too, and Karpov won. Uh, this was played in 1993, and this is the beginning of the whole Fide versus Kasparov uh, history. So it all started in 1991 with, with this match. But coming back to 1991, these are still the qualifiers, and, and Anand is playing his match against Karpov. So this was the quarterfinal. In this position, king f8 played, king f2, and black is a pawn up on the king's side. Black has to convert simply. I'm going to go through this game fairly quickly. King e7, king e3, knight d7, g3. Uh, knight f6. The knight transfers to a much more promising square. And now to e1, uh, to e8, excuse me, and looking at d6. Once the knight gets to d6, it will be controlling the entire board, basically. Bishop c2, knight d6, bishop d3, bishop b7, uh, moving in anticipation of any trouble on the c file and also making his rook much more active. h4 played by Karpov, knight c4 played, offering a trade of uh, knight for bishop, which in this position is of course favorable for black, because the bishop is a strong piece when there are pawns on both sides of the board. Despite all black pawns being on dark squares, meaning this bishop has no targets, it means that the bishop has a lot more scope. So it's going to be really hard to restrain this bishop. This has to be taken, otherwise a knight takes rook. So takes, takes. Rook d4. If the rooks are traded off, it's going to be very hard to win. Probably still winning, but white's king is very active and there could be some issues. Of course, if you take the king, go already comes to d4. And if the white king manages to enter the queen side, then there's going to be trouble. So rook c5, declining the trade, a4, e5, an excellent move. Uh, in this posi position, this chases the rook away, because if you take, your king is going to have to move away and my rook is going to be able to enter your position on one of these squares, so rook b4, uh, of course threatening to take this one, and if you take, then I take your bishop, so bishop c6 is the only move. Now a b5, a b5, of course you take with the pawn, you don't want to trade, and now knight to e2. And in this position, uh, Anand simply solidifies his position, f6, preparing to recapture with the pawn on e5 if a trade happens, rook b3, king e6, improving his king, rook a3, and now rook to c2, attacking the pawn, and after fe5, fe5, rook a6, simply king to d6, and the pawn is still under attack. Now, if you move the b-pawn forward, which actually happened in the game, then that becomes an easy target. If you don't move the pawn forward, then you have to play rook a2, which is met with uh, bishop to, to d5, and after rook a6 check, king to c5, and the pawn drops. So b4. And now watch what happens. Rook c4, very simple. And now, the, why I wanted to show you this game, he just snuffs out all counterplay. Rook a7, bishop d7, perfect. You don't rush taking the pawn, you don't want simplifications. Rook a6, check, king e7, preparing to defend if the, if the rook comes to g6. So after rook g6, king f7, everything defended. Rook d6, attacks the bishop, bishop g4, attacking the knight and making sure that there are no checks. And after rook d5, and Anand's next move, Karpov actually gave up. So if you trade the pawns, then it's going to be easier for, for white to play this position. So takes on b4, takes on e5, and kind of dry, but rook c2. And now there is no more salvation. Karpov gave up. So this is an example of active, but also extremely precise prophylactic play. If, for example, knight g1, saving the knight, which is the only move, basically, 
then I can just go rook g2 and uh, and that's it. You just resign and th this knight is lost. So, so yeah, this I just wanted to show you to give you a brief intro of how Anand entered his world championship matches and to show you how nicely he could convert his advantages. Okay, moving on. Uh, the next game was played between Anand and one of his biggest rivals, Vladimir Kramnik, uh, who of course lost the title to Anand later on in 2006. And we reach a position in which Anand has, uh, in which Anand has two pawns for the exchange. This was played in 1996 in the Max Juve Memorial, the sixth Max Juve Mem Memorial. And for the last 20 moves, Anand has been making slight progress. We reach a critical position in which, if if you don't find a way forward, Black is going to be able to create a fortress which you won't be able to break through. And it's really hard to do something in this position with black. Even though you have two pawns, this pawn is very good at defending everything. This bishop is controlling some lovely squares. And the rooks are, of course, very active, meaning that you have to be extra careful about any infiltrations. So it's not really easy to move your king up the board. It's not really easy to move your f-pawn. And there's not much you can do. But, excuse me. Anand comes up with an absolutely astonishing move which just wins this position easily and I would like to invite you to pause the video and find an idea here uh, for black so find an active idea for black okay so he played the only winning move uh, h3 okay so first of all what happens if king f2 for example well, if king f2 or king f1, then bishop takes h2, and it's easy. If king to g1, still defending h2, then that means that this king is stuck on the back rank, this pawn is a permanent weakness, and this knight has an easy way into the position, targeting multiple weaknesses. Uh, of course, you would like to do that in the moment when it won't be so easy for... Uh, for, for white to exchange, exchange the knight, but if your rook is able to come to c1 with check, then actually the timing here is quite good for knight g6, and if the knight comes to h4, then white can basically resign. So after h3, uh, Kramlin has nothing better but to accept the sacrifice. And here's the point. Now this fairly passive rook, because of the bishop on c2, enters the game with deadly consequences. There is no way to save material for white now. Rook h8 check. The king only has... Whoa. Just a second. Just a second. Whoa. Uh, rook h8, and if king to g2, then rook takes h2. That wasn't played in the game. He played that a move, uh, a move later. Just let me show you what happened. Knight c6 was played first, and rook c3 attacks the knight. He wanted to transfer the knight to a more active square first. He can always play rook h8 later. He was, of course, with knight c6 threatening to play knight to d4, so this also comes with tempo. So after rook c3, he now unpins and plays rook h8 check. After king to g2, he does not take straight away. He plays knight to d4 first, and now the rook has to move, of course. If the rook goes to d2, then you take it. So rook to f2, and now rook takes h2 check, king f1, uh, and rook h1 check. And now these pieces become, well, monsters. Now it's three pawns against one, white still has the exchange, but in a moment it's just going to be game over. King g2 played, and rook c1, pinning the bishop, attacking the bishop twice. And in this position Kramnik went wrong. I don't think there's a way to save it. He played an active move, he played rook c4. But he undefended a key square, so this is basically black to play and win. Find the winning move for black. Okay, in this position, it's a simple double attack, uh, bishop to e3. Of course, the bishop is attacked twice, so if you move this rook away, I'm going to take with check. Uh, and there's no other options. If you play rook e2, I take with the knight. If you play rook d2, I take with the bishop. So the only way to partially save material is to give up the exchange back, so rook takes d4. 
bishop takes d4 and this is now clean to pawns up he went on to convert this win in well about 20 moves but he still went on to win and there's no need to to keep looking at this this i thought was an astonish an astonishing game so coming back to the original position if you just shuffle your pieces around it's going to be really hard to win this so he finds h3 forcing king h3 then he gains a couple of tempi uh, on the black pieces with knight d4 here and after the rook moves it's just deadly king f1 rook h1 check king g2 rook c1 and you can see how active these pieces are even though black has the exchange you could argue that both of these minor pieces are better than than any of the rooks and yeah what you what do you do here i have no idea let's see what the engine says uh yeah the engine actually says rook c4 everything else loses even more it says minus 1.9 with rook c4 everything else is minus 5 so a brilliant game, a brilliant idea to break through, the only idea to break through. Okay, and this last game is part of history, uh, connected to uh, Vichy Anand. This was the game which, this was part of, of the finals uh, he played against Alexei Shiro in 2000, the World Championship Knockout Tournament. And they only played four games, Anand won three and a half to half and claimed victory and became the world champion for the first time. So just a, a, a brief historical intro about this. Uh, the knockout tournament in 2000 uh, uh, was, was played as a, knock, a knockout, excuse me, and after uh, si world championship cycle 17, so the previous one, FIDE abandoned its match-based championship uh, and created a new tournament-based championship title. Uh, built around the, the format of the candidates and uh, you basically get a champion from a tournament not from a match and that's uh, that's something very similar to the format of the US championship and the knockout matches were best of two games except for the semi-finals which was best of four and finals which was best of six so these are the finals and Anand had already had three and a half after four games so he won if the matches were tied, you would play Rapid and then Blitz. Okay, uh, Anand defeated Bologan, Liputian, Matieja, uh, Kalifman, Adams, and finally played against Shirov. Okay, so with this game, he was crowned the world champion for the first time, or with, with this match. So we start in a position which is one up for... Uh, for white, I should say this was game two, game one they drew. It's a pawn up for white, and white should be better, but it's not easy to convert this. And black has excellent drawing chances. Uh, it's because white has these double pawns, and black's pieces are fairly active, black's king is fairly safe, and the knight doesn't really have good infiltration squares into the position. So, Vichy has white, he starts with rook to f4, and the bishop retreats to f5, offering this exchange. Now, if, if knight takes f5, g takes f5, then it would be really hard to liquidate this pawn, and it would be much closer to a draw. So, rook a7, played by Anand, putting pressure on the c7 pawn. This now, of course, allows a pawn trade if... Uh, if, if Anand wants it, so rook takes e3 played, attacking this pawn. And of course, if you take on c7, then I'm going to take on, on c3. So an excellent move by Anand, c4. Uh, you can also play g4, chasing the bishop away first, for example, to b1. And now you can continue c4, and after rook c5, rook takes c7. So this would be pretty similar. It's just that this bishop is slightly worse. So maybe g4 was slightly more precise, but c4. Nonetheless, the rook goes to c5, and now finally rook takes c7. And in this position, uh, it's still a drawn endgame, according to the engines. But black is the one who has to be extremely precise. Trading of the e3 pawn, uh, which was far away from queening, for the c7 pawn, which is blockading the, six, the c6 pawn, which is the strongest pawn on the board, may not, be, may not have been a good idea, but it, it makes sense in a way that the, the position is about to get simplified. Okay, uh, rook to e4 played by, 
by Shirov. And in this position you have two options. You can take on f5 uh, or you can or you can take uh, or you can take the rook. Uh, Anand went for rook takes uh, rook takes here. If knight takes f5, then for example, if rook takes f4, then rook c8 is made, so you cannot trade like that. So we have to accept this knight. And now rook takes e4, f takes e4 would probably lead to an easy draw after king f2 and rook takes c4 and king e3 and king g7 the king comes out and you basically no, have no way to shepherd this pawn to queening because the black king is too active and the black rook is perfectly positioned to defend and attack and your king cannot really approach. So after rook e4 Anand played a much better move he played rook takes e4 and of course after bishop takes e4 uh, he now has to be careful. If he's not careful, then rook c4 is coming, and bishop takes c6 is coming, and instead of being uh, of not being careful, he played rook to e7. This gains a crucial tempo on the bishop and also prepares to advance the pawn to c7. And black has nothing better but to save the bishop with bishop f5. Now again, you you are at a crossroads. You can play. Knight takes f5, and after g takes f5, you can play rook c7. Uh, c7 would lead to an easily drawn position. So after rook c7, rook takes c4, king f2, rook c2 check, king f3, king g7. Again, this is a drawn endgame because this king is close enough to stop the pawn from queening. So after bishop f5, Aran simply played c7. And now it's not as easy. Uh, now black has to be extra careful. It's still a draw if you play carefully but now you have to play the most precise move otherwise you just lose so pause the, pause the video what would you play here with black okay uh, in the game uh, Shirov just lost here and I'm going to show you how and why uh, he played king f8 now here's the difference what he should have played is king to g7, which may seem counterintuitive, but it's actually a drawing move. After king f8, knight takes f5. Of course, you don't take with the rook because a queen. So g takes f5. Rook to d7. Uh, now, king to e8 would be met with rook d8 and, and winning. So game over. And if rook takes c4, then again rook d8 check, king d7, and c8 equals queen. So after rook d7, threatening to, to queen, you have to go back to g7. So Shirov had wasted a crucial tempo, and it's incredible that one tempo is so important here. But I'm going to show you what would have happened if he'd played king g7 straight away. So after c7, if you play king g7 instead of king f8, now let's let's first go for the same variation. Knight takes f5, which he'd played after king f8, and g takes f5, and now rook d7. Let's pretend that we are playing the same variation. The, the difference is that the king is not on f8; it's on g7. Now rook takes c4, and if, for example, h4, then king f6. Let's say rook d6 check and king e7, and of course you have to trade these two, and, and it's going to be a draw. If you don't play rook d6, then I'm going to play here on the next move, and it's, again, I'm going to win the pawn. So the king is quick enough to play king f6, king e6, draw. If after king g7 the bishop is not traded, but instead h4 first, then king f6, knight f5 again, g f5, and again, now if you play rook d7, I play king e6. So, for example, rook e3, rook takes c7, rook c3, easy draw. This king can now stop the pawn. Unfortunately for Shirov, he played king f8, which is extremely bad. I already showed you why. So, knight f5, g f5, rook d7, king g7 forced, rook d4 defends the pawn, and now after rook takes c7, it's simply bad for black because this pawn is protected because white's king can enter the game quickly king f6 king e3 king e6 this is now a tempo ahead and it's an easy win g3 f6 if king f4 this should be a draw after h5 and h4 and rook c6 everything is perfectly blockaded but 
Vichy plays after f6, a move which I think is very hard to find. I think it would be very natural for most players to just play king f4 because it gets the king closer to the center. But in fact, king d, king d3 is a winning move. And now this king is about to shepherd the pawn. And if the rook moves away, then the king can switch back. Uh, so rook a7 played by Shirov, king to c3, uh, king to e5 played in this position and rook h4. And now you have one target, one passed pawn, your only weakness is defended, f4 is prevented and, and black resigns, basically. Rook b7, a waiting move, rook f4, rook b1 trying to get behind the pawns. And now, well, th this is why I love the game. He just gave Shirov no counterplay, rook f2. Make your rook more passive, don't care about winning five moves later, just make sure that black has no counterplay. Rook c1 check played, king b4, king e6. If king d6, then of course rook takes f5, so you cannot prevent the white king from entering the position. So you have to play king e6, keeping an eye on the f5 pawn, but now king b5. Of course not king to, be, uh, king to c5, because then rook b1 would delay things. Now if a check, then you can go to b6. King d6 gives up the pawn otherwise white just plays king b6 and wins eventually rook takes f5 rook b1 check fine i'm not going to to c6 excuse me not b6 king a4 rook to b2 played attacking the h2 pawn and now a simple conversion rook f6 king c5 rook h6 king c4 watch out for checkmates so you have to dislodge the king first rook h4 King d5 and rook takes h7 and, and that's it. He won 20 moves later, but it's a simply winning endgame. Let me show you how. So even though the white king is cut off, the black king cannot enter the position and the black rook has to help, meaning that the white king can, can get out. And if the black king keeps cutting off the white king, then the pawns move forward, as is the case here. And now that the rook has moved, the king approaches and after king b3, Alexei Shirov resigned. So I hope you got something from these games. Uh, I I love Vish's endgame play and I'm going to be doing part two of his games as well. I'm probably going to be doing part two for all the players I covered in the series because for the moment I have a list of 40 endgames played by Anand which I would like to cover. So it's going to be several parts. Uh, if you have any games you would like to suggest, please comment below. And again, if you'd like to get PGN uh, for the video, you can find it in your Patreon feed. Thank you very much for watching and stay tuned for more chess. Bye-bye.